I am Israeli and an American, which is a dangerous combination, because that means I talk way, way, way too fast. So you just got to tell me when I'm going too fast, OK? Be Israeli, as I always say, and not Norwegian, where you're just going to sit there and have me go really fast. Just somebody say to me, and I'll slow down, OK? Just be my, be my anchor, if you will. OK, so thank you so much for listening. There I go again. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I appreciate it. But um, like I said, I'm an educator. And what I'd love to do is educate us a little bit about really what happened on October 7th, but more importantly, how we got there, and what's happening now. Uh, what's, what's, what does the future hold? Now, I, I can't really tell you that, but I can tell you what people are saying. And we'll go from there. So first, I'm always a big believer in starting with a map. Uh, you'd be shocked to see how many people have never seen a map of Israel before. Or if they have, they have seen maybe a false map, or usually not a good one. So I always start with a map so we can understand the territory that we're talking about. And of course, we're talking about this territory down the south, the area of the Gaza Strip. It's kind of ironic in Israel. We call it the south because, as you see, it is not the south. It is the center of the country uh, to, the, to the west. But um, anything south of Tel Aviv in Israel is considered south. And therefore, we call it the south. So we're going to talk about Gaza. Uh, we have to talk about, first of all, what happened. October 7th was by far the darkest day in Israeli history. There's no debates about that. And it changed all of us. It changed me. I became a very different person on October 7th and since. And what I'll also say is I, you know, you've heard my story and I could definitely say that for much of my life as an educator for Israel, I've been very conflicted. It's a conflict and there's a lot of different emotions and different feelings and you're kind of pushed and pulled in many different directions, especially if you're challenging yourself and pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. In the last five weeks, I have not felt conflicted at all. I have actually felt very, very resolved. Because after October 7th, it became very, very clear what we needed to do to be able to live peacefully in our land. And I want to say that as resolved as I am, I'm also challenged because I always knew the price that it would take to eliminate Hamas in Gaza. And it's not a price that any of us ever wanted to exact because we understood the toll. So I'm resolved, but it's also very hard to watch what's happening, knowing it has to happen, but it's still painful. So let's understand. On October 7th, Hamas invaded Israel from three, in three ways, land, air, and sea. They crossed the border surrounding Gaza into Israel. They took over a few military bases. And then the Hamas terror squads made their way to the southern communities of Israel. They entered into over 20 communities. And they massacred people. There's no other way to, to, ex to explain it. Uh, they, they brutalized people. They tortured people in ways that are hard to explain and really hard to comprehend or even fathom. They mutilated people in front of their family members. They chopped off children's fingers in front of their parents. They gouged out a father's eyes in front of his children. They murdered babies. They shot them in the face. They burned them alive. I'm sorry to be so graphic, but I live in a world now where for the last five weeks, I have not just had to explain this, but I've had to actually prove it to people. Because I've lived in a world where apparently women's rights only apply to all women other than Jews. That when we say believe victims of rape, it doesn't apply to Jewish women or Israeli women. In that case, we have to prove it. And so I'm sorry to be so graphic, but we experienced gang rape of not just women, but of children. 
We experience things that, again, we in Israel, we struggle to properly comprehend. And we realized truly the depths of the hatred against us. That we have been completely and totally dehumanized in the eyes of Hamas. <coughs> and that is why we also came to the conclusion that we came to. We also know that on October 7th, they didn't just attack southern communities, but they attacked a music festival, what was supposed to be a peace festival, where they specifically told all of the attendees to not bring weapons. So they were defenseless. As Hamas paragliders paraglided in to the festival grounds with machine guns and then proceeded to hunt Jews and Israelis. We also know that that day they fired over 3,000 rockets into Israel, killing people as well an entire Bedouin family. They lost four of their children in one rocket strike that day. And rockets have continued to rain down on Israel since. We've had nearly 10,000 rockets now falling on Israel for the last five weeks. Nobody is mentioning this on the news. Yeah? Anyone? No. Because as soon as Israel started to respond in Gaza, that became the news cycle. And most people have forgotten October 7th. And I think the reason why in Israel we are so resolved to what we are doing in Gaza right now and why the word ceasefire doesn't come out of our mouths is because we will never forget October 7th. Because it was our friends and our family members. And like I said, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I didn't know anyone who was killed. But I am surrounded by people who have buried friends and family members. And now I have many friends who were called up for reserve duty who are now stationed on borders or are inside of Gaza. And I don't know if my friends are inside Gaza. And I won't know until they come out, either alive or, God forbid, the other horrible alternative. So the world might have continued on. And the world can march on behalf of the Palestinians, but we have not moved on. This is our new reality. And October 7th will be a day that will live in infamy for the Jewish people and for Israel until kingdom come. It changed us. It made us realize the depths of the hatred against us and what we need to do to protect ourselves in this world. We've also woken up to the fact that if Israel didn't exist in this world, that Jews would probably yet again be in a place where nobody would be defending them. And there would be the select few, people like you sitting in this room, the righteous among the nations, those who always stood by the Jews in their times of hardship, but usually never having enough power to actually be able to protect us. So it's two battles that we're fighting. It's a battle against Hamas, and then it's a PR battle <coughs> in the world to try to defend our ability and our right to defend ourselves. That's what we're dealing with. So let's understand what happened. Look, I want to go into a history, first of all, and talk to you about Hamas. Let's do that first. What's Hamas? Hamas is a, a recognized terrorist organization. The word Hamas is an acronym that means Islamic, re I always mess it up, Islamic resistance movement. It was founded in 1987, late 1987. Their founding charter will be issued in 1988. And they, make, they don't hide their intentions in their founding charter. It states very clearly that their goal is the obliteration of Israel and that they're going to wipe out the Jews. That is their stated intent, a genocidal intent against the Jewish people and calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. And that is probably the most important thing that I will say about them. They are not an organization that is interested in a peaceful solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The only solution for them is Israel not existing anymore, which doesn't work for us. And it shouldn't work for anyone, as far as I'm concerned. And yet there are people around the world waving flags, calling from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Do I need to put the map up again? For us to understand what that means? No. We know. 
It's not an aspirational call for independence and freedom. It's a call for the elimination of the state of Israel. And that's Hamas. Now, Hamas has been recognized as a terrorist organization by the United States, by the European Union, and by many other countries and organizations around the world. Why? Because Hamas has always targeted innocent civilians for religious motivations. That is terrorism, according to any definition of terrorism that we have in the world today. Somebody should tell the BBC. This isn't complicated. But you know, they will continue to call them militants. Hamas, when they started, were a band of terrorists. They weren't skilled, they weren't fighters, they didn't have training. But in the 1990s, the Israelis exiled the Hamas leadership to southern Lebanon. And there, they found friends called Hezbollah. Hezbollah, another terror organization that was backed by Iran at the time, and still is. And Hezbollah trained them. They trained them how to make bombs, and they trained them how to be fighters. And then they came back to the West Bank during the Oslo peace process, which eh, right here, right? Here we are. Oslo, the Israelis reached out their hand and they shook Yasser Arafat's hand, a man who up to, until that point was a terrorist who had killed many Israelis. And they started to agree to withdraw from Palestinian areas, the major cities of the West Bank and 80% of the Gaza Strip. And that bothered Hamas because Hamas didn't want to see a peace agreement. They didn't want to see a two-state solution. By the way, neither did Yasser Arafat, but that's another story for another time. And they started suicide bombings, and that's what happened. 1994, we have the first suicide bombing committed by a Hamas terrorist, and that will continue through the 90s. And then comes the year 2000, and in that year, Israel offered the Palestinians a state in 97% of the West Bank and 100% of the Gaza Strip. And it was rejected. And a wave of terror was launched, the Second Intifada. By the end of that wave of terror, in 2005, the Israelis decided to entirely withdraw from the Gaza Strip. Entirely, 100%. We pulled 8,000 people out of their homes in what many would call settlements, destroying those settlements, and we, let, we pulled 20,000 soldiers out of Gaza who were protecting the border and the settlements. And Gaza was Jew-free, Judenrein, as they say, in Germany. I'm gonna leave it there for now and I'll pick up on the history in just a second. Because to help us understand this, we have to go further back in time. Because people would say, well, wait a second, you shouldn't have been in Gaza at all. Right? From the beginning, you shouldn't have been in Gaza. This is Palestinian land. We've all heard this, right? So let's talk a little bit about the history, right? First of all, let's go back before 1948. A lot of people think before 1948 there was a country called Palestine. And they get very offended when I teach them basic history. There was no country called Palestine. And I'm not saying it to be offensive, I'm saying it to be factually correct there was a territory called the British Mandate of Palestine, which was a British-controlled territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. So prior to 1948, there was never Palestinian governance of this territory, just like there was never Jewish governance of this territory, unless you go back 2,000 years to when the Jews had a commonwealth there that was destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 of the Common Era. So before 1948, you had Jews and you had Arabs living in this land under the control of the British administration. And the British had said that what they wanted to create was two states in this territory, a state for the Jews and a state for the Arabs. And by 1947, they had handed the problem over to the United Nations. And the UN divided the land. 45% was gonna to go to the Arabs, 55% was gonna to go to the Jews. And the Jews accepted that plan and the Arab leadership rejected that plan. And they launched a war. And in that war, Israel becomes Israel, that map that I showed you in the beginning. But the territory of Gaza was taken by the Egyptians. Now, Egypt never should have had that territory. It was never part of Egypt, not historically, it was never part of Egypt. But Egypt had invaded, and that was the territory that they got in that war. And that's how we end up with a line around Gaza for the first time. And it becomes the Gaza Strip. 
Now, from 1948, 49, the end of the war, until 1967, the Gaza Strip is controlled by Egypt. One could say occupied by Egypt, because Egypt never annexed it and made it part of Egypt. It remained under Egyptian control. And then came 1967, and the Egyptians declared war on Israel in the middle of May. Israel eventually fights back in this war and gains control over the territory of the Gaza Strip, as well as all of the Sinai Peninsula. And Israel remains in power in Gaza from 1967 until 2005. Now, in that window of time, what we have to acknowledge is that Israel did much to build up the territory of the Gaza Strip. They laid down most of the key infrastructure in Gaza, underground, above ground. They paved a lot of the roads, and they built the universities and the hospitals. This all happened under Israeli occupation, Israeli military control. And in the late 1970s into the 80s, Israel also started to build settlements in Gaza. And so by the time we get to 2005, Israel has now 8,000 Israeli settlers living inside of the Gaza Strip. And throughout the 80s and into the 90s, there was actually really remarkable coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. The Israelis would go do their shopping in Gaza City. Palestinians would be working in the fields and the greenhouses of the Israeli communities. There were good relations. And then came Oslo. People called the pre-Oslo period the good old times before peace, when people actually coexisted. But then politics got involved. And things started to get worse in Gaza. And all of a sudden, Hamas and other terror organizations started to fire mortars into Israeli communities in Gaza. And if you tried to travel into these communities, you might be shot on the road. I know. I went into Gaza. True story. Back in the early 2000s, uh, a friend of mine had her bat mitzvah at a nice hotel on the beach of Gaza. And to get in, we had to be escorted by a convoy of Israeli soldiers so that we would be safe driving along that road. So the second intifada breaks out. That's where I left us off at the last, right before. And for those four and a half years, which I spoke about at length in my first talk, over 1,000 Israelis are murdered. And of those, 40% of them are at the hands of Hamas. And even with that, with pressure from the Americans and the will to want to reignite the peace process, right? Our Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, decides to withdraw from Gaza entirely. All 8,000 settlers, 20,000 soldiers out to the line. It is now for the Palestinians. And in August of 2005, everyone was pulled out. The Palestinians could have taken this territory and made it great. It's a, 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 an area on the coast of the Mediterranean. You could have made it flourish. It could have become the Singapore of the Middle East if they wanted it. We left all the infrastructure. We left the greenhouses. Everything was left behind. It was promptly destroyed. Four months later, in 2006, Hamas gets elected. Now, a lot of people say that Hamas got elected because of everyone supports terror. That's what people would argue. Everyone supported terror, so Hamas gets elected. Now, that's not true. Some people supported terrorism. Hamas ran on that platform. They said, look, we've just spent the last four and a half years murdering Israelis, and they pulled out of Gaza. Success. Vote for us, and we'll keep killing Israelis, and they'll pull out of more land. And people voted for them as a result. But we also have to remember that Hamas, while they were a terrorist organization, they also presented themselves as a social welfare organization. Throughout the 90s and into the aughts, they built schools and clinics. And they helped the economy, and they gave people jobs. And so if I'm somebody in Gaza, by the time you get to the 2000s, the only people taking care of me are Hamas. Fatah is corrupt. They're the rival party, right, of Yasser Arafat and now Mahmoud Abbas. And they're corrupt, and they're taking all of the money for themselves. And who's taking care of me? Hamas. They built a $2 clinic in Gaza. And you could go, and you could get health care for $2. They won over hearts and minds. And so in 2006, they ran on change for the better. And people voted for them. 
So they won overwhelmingly. Not just in Gaza, by the way. This election was for all the Palestinians, so in the West Bank and Gaza. And they won overwhelmingly. But the problem was, is after this happened, the world, the Americans, the Israelis, said to Hamas, listen, you're a terrorist organization. So for us to work with you, you have to do three things. Recognize Israel, end the violence against Israel, and recognize all past agreements with Israel, Oslo, essentially. And Hamas obviously said, no, we're not going to recognize Israel. Our charter says that we want to obliterate Israel, right? And they didn't get power. Fatah didn't give them power. A year and a half goes by. And in June of 2007, seeing that they're not going to get power legitimately, Hamas initiates a violent coup against, the Palestinian, against their own people, the Palestinians, specifically Fatah in Gaza. And they go to Fatah offices and they throw people out windows. And they take them out to the roofs of buildings and they throw them off. And in June of 2007, Hamas takes full control over Gaza. Now let's remember that a year earlier, in June of 2006, Hamas has already used one of their tunnels to attack Israel and to kidnap an Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, who will then be held in Gaza for five and a half years as a hostage. A word that if I don't have to ever say again in my life, it will, it will be too soon. Because I, I, that word, I just, it's been too much in the last few weeks. Five years. In 2007, Israel decides, OK, Hamas took over. We have to implement a blockade. Not a siege, a blockade. Meaning, we seal our borders, and we seal the waterways. Now, remember, there's a border with Egypt. Egypt also sealed their border, because Hamas threatens them as well. And the blockade is upheld. And what was the idea? Stop any weapons or anything that can be used as weapons from getting to Hamas. So there was a short list of things that could go into Gaza. And if it wasn't on the list, couldn't go into Gaza. Israel's policy was separate and isolate. Short list. People said, why can't chocolate go into Gaza? And what was the answer? It's not on the list. We don't care. It's a terrorist organization. And people said, collective punishment. All the basic needs were still going into Gaza, just not the luxuries. Separate and isolate. And then came 2010, and there was this flotilla incident that maybe some of us remember. And it prompted Israel to reevaluate the blockade. So they reevaluate, and they change the blockade. Now, here's a short list of things that can't go into Gaza. Everything else can go into Gaza. Chocolate starts flowing into Gaza. And remember that throughout all of this, while the world is screaming at us, Gilad Shalit is still in captivity, and no one is calling for his release. Sound familiar? It should. Just like our 240 hostages have become an afterthought for everybody but us. So 10 years go by, from 2010 till 2020. And in that time, we have two different operations with Hamas in Gaza, 2012 and 2014. And then we obviously, we had the other two on the tail in 2008 to 2021. And in those operations, Hamas usually fired rockets at Israel. And Israel would respond from the air. But in 2014, we went in on the ground. Why? Because Hamas had developed a tunnel network throughout Gaza. And they were using those tunnels to attack Israel. So we needed to destroy the terror tunnel network. And so we sent our forces into Gaza. And in the span of 50 days fighting an operation against Hamas, we managed to eliminate 90% of their terror tunnel network. We also, tragically, killed 2,200 Palestinians, half of them innocent civilians, the other half terrorists. Now again, I'll say it and I'll say it again, I don't want innocent people to die. And by the way, no Israeli wants innocent people to die. We just don't. The reality is this fighting against terrorists is very hard because they embed themselves within the civilian population. And actually, in this type of fighting, to have a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning for every one combatant, one innocent civilian is killed, is actually a remarkably low number for the type of combat that we engaged in, which demonstrates Israel's active effort to minimize risk to civilians. Doesn't matter if it's your family member. The pain is there, the suffering is there, and the hatred could develop. 
After 2014, the world yet again screamed, send in the aid. And Israel said, okay. And they said, send in the concrete. You got to send in the concrete because you just destroyed a bunch of buildings. Send in the concrete to rebuild, even though we knew the concrete was being used to build tunnels. But we sent in the aid. And then Hamas started to act like a government. And they started to develop the economy a little bit in Gaza, acting like they didn't want to focus on Israel anymore. So we started to send in Qatari money to keep Hamas alive in Gaza. Brinks trucks full of Qatari cash is coming into Gaza so Hamas can pay their salaries and stay alive and continue to sort of take care of people so that they won't rise up against Israel again. And seven years go by. And in that time, Hamas rebuilds the power plant in Gaza, now is supplying 55% of the electricity to the people of Gaza. They had overpumped from their aquifer, freshwater aquifer, which poisoned the groundwater. And so then they had to build a desalinization plant, right, to desalinate the water, which they did, which is why now 90% of the water in Gaza comes from Gaza. Only 10% comes from Israel. And Israel, and we can't ignore the fact that we started to have more and more of a right-wing government in Israel that didn't want to see necessarily a two-state solution come to be. Let's just be honest. And they thought, keep the Palestinians separate, Fatah and Hamas, keep them against each other. If you build up Hamas, you weaken Fatah. But don't worry, because we have enough walls and fences and defenses around Gaza that they won't be able to attack us. We were wrong. In 2021, we ended up in another conflict, May of 2021. And it had nothing to do with Hamas and Gaza. It had to do with Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa and other places. But Hamas is again in a, in a rivalry with Fatah. And so when Fatah was getting involved, Hamas had to get involved. And so they fired rockets at us. And then they kept firing rockets at us, which made us end up having to go into Gaza. Not on the ground, from the air. Another two week operation. That operation ends, and by the way, how did all of these operations end? With that thing, right? It's called a ceasefire. Yeah. It's the reason we're not for one anymore. The last thing Israel did, and I want you to understand what I just explained. I just explained that from 2007 onwards, Israel started with a very harsh policy towards Hamas in Gaza, and then got nicer and nicer and nicer to the point that by the time we get to October 6th, 2023, we are sending in 30,000 tons of aid into Gaza every single week through the Karim Shalom crossing. 30,000 tons. Not only are we sending in aid, but two years ago, the world, Gaza, came to us and said, look, you need to give permits. It'll help, it'll better the situation. If you give Gazans the ability to work inside of southern Israel, they'll make more money, and they'll be less inclined to be terrorists. And Israel was worried about this, but we did it anyway. And in the last two years, Israel gave 18,000 permits to Palestinians in Gaza to work inside of southern Israel. We now know that some of those people were not just working inside of Israel. They were working for Hamas. And what they were doing every time they crossed the border is they were gathering intelligence. Where are our army bases? How often do they patrol? How many soldiers are there at any given time? Where are the southern communities? Where are their entrances? Where are their exits? How do you get into them? How many people patrol those areas at any given time? How, many, how much security do they have? Where are the armories? Where are the clinics? Where are the schools? So that every terrorist who entered Israel had a map of exactly the community they were going to and exactly how to infiltrate that community and to butcher Israelis. I'm resolved. I'm resolved because at this point, I asked myself, what else could Israel have done? What more could we do right now? People say ceasefire. I said there was a ceasefire on October 7th. It was broken by Hamas. And they came and they slaughtered us. So what's the answer? And that's what I say to people now. When somebody says Israel needs to cease fire, you say why? Hamas attacked them. 
They're defending themselves. Since when do you tell the person who is attacked to stop firing instead of telling the person who did the attacking to stop attacking and to release the hostages? Why is this complicated? And we in Israel are sitting here so frustrated because people say ceasefire and I say, how is that gonna keep me safe? Well, it'll stop the casualties in Gaza. How is that gonna keep me safe? But my safety is not their concern and it never has been. So I'm resolved and I hate that I'm resolved. Do you know why every time we went into Gaza, we didn't have the goal of eliminating Hamas? because we knew the price. And we never wanted to exact it, like I said earlier. And they left us no choice on October 7th. They've said to us since October 7th, we're gonna keep doing this. Hamas got on TV and said it. We'll do an October 7th over and over and over again until they are gone. Well, I'm not going anywhere. So Hamas, you're gonna be gone. That's what's gonna happen now. Because you've left me no choice. And the tragedy is that innocent Palestinians are paying the price. And they always do. So who's backing Hamas? Let's not ignore the international influences and the network that we are seeing. Hamas is controlled by Iran, mostly. They're funded by Iran. They're supported by Iran. They're also supported by the Qataris as well, who have been funding Hamas for many of the last years. Iran has other proxies in this region as well. Israel is, Hamas is not their only proxy that they use to fight against Israel. We are obviously dealing with Hezbollah, we'll talk more about them in a second. We're dealing with the Houthis in Yemen, we'll talk more about them in a second. So we have Iran, we have the tacit support coming from Qatar and Turkey, which is another one that I haven't mentioned, who have expressed great support for Hamas in the last few years. And then you have the other side of the coin in the Arab world, which are the Abraham Accord countries. The United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, the Saudis would be in that camp. We know the Saudis were right on the verge, right, of normalizing relations with Israel before October 7th, which is probably one of the reasons that it happened. So why did it happen? First of all, to stop normalization with the Saudis. No doubt about it. They were getting nervous. The Palestinians were feeling backed into a corner. All the Arab countries are making peace with Israel. They're normalizing relations. We're gonna be left out to dry. We need to stop this. We need to disrupt the balance in the Middle East and what's happening. And if, if we attack Israel, they're gonna respond and they're gonna end up having to kill a lot of Palestinians and the world will end up falling on our side and so will the Arab world. And if anyone watched the news yesterday, we know there was an Arab summit just yesterday in Saudi Arabia. And who was welcomed? The president of Iran, Raisi. The president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad. Greeted like kings. And they all got together and decided that there needs to be an immediate ceasefire. Shocking. And I will say the one thing, because this has been making me nervous. Will the Abraham Accords hold given what's happening. And I, from what I heard, the Saudis really pushed, you know, the Iranians and the Syrians were pushing for full cut off of ties from the Israelis, cut off all ties. And apparently the Saudis actually went to bat for Israel and said, no, we're not going to a full cutting off of ties. We will condemn and we will support a ceasefire, but we're not cutting off all ties. So maybe, just maybe, some of these countries still see the value in having Israel as a friend. And let's be honest, they never really have cared about Palestinians. And they've demonstrated that over and over and over again in their actions. So that's one of the reasons. Um, look, Hamas ultimately wants to take over the West Bank. They want to weaken Fatah. This gained them tremendous support, tremendous support. So they're weakening Fatah in the West Bank and we're seeing more things heating up in the West Bank now as we speak. So that's another reason. And then as they really miscalculated Israelis. <laughs> Look, we were really divided before October 7th. The most divided that I've ever seen Israel in my entire life. And it was very scary. And they thought that this would tear us apart. It did just the opposite. And any Jewish person could have told you that. 
Tragically, what unites us more than anything else is when we come under attack. And so we have united, and Israelis are resolved. And we see more support now within Israel of Israel, not just of Jewish Israelis, which spiked, by the way, to 94% supporting what the government is doing right now and supporting what the army is doing. Arab Israelis, it jumped to 70%. This is huge. Why? Why? And the answer is simple. Because Jews were not just the target on October 7th. Every Israeli was a target on October 7th. A man, a Muslim man and his wife were driving in their car on October 7th. She was in a hijab, very visibly Muslim. And they were stopped by Hamas terrorists and they shot her in the head in front of her husband. They didn't discriminate on October 7th. They killed everybody. And Israeli Arabs and Israeli Christians and Muslims and Bedouins have all stood by Israel in this fight because they realized that is in the eyes of Hamas, they're Israelis. And they will be killed just like any other Jewish Israeli. So they definitely miscalculated our resolve. And I would also add that they miscalculated the American response. They didn't expect the Americans to do what they've been doing since this war broke out. Thank you to Joe Biden, because Man, we need friends right now, and it's good to have at least one in this world. So we've explained the atrocities. I'm just going to mention them again because, again, they need to be mentioned over and over and over again. You know, we say never again. Well, never again started over on October 7th. And just like people have denied the Holocaust for many, many years, it is remarkable for me to see real-time denial of a massacre that was so well-documented. Hamas wore their GoPro cameras and they filmed their atrocities. They put it online. They were proud of what they did. And yet still there's people saying, no, they didn't kill babies. No, they didn't rape women. No, they didn't murder families and burn them alive. I've seen all the videos. I wish I had never, but I've seen the videos of the burnt bodies, and I've seen the photos of the burnt children and babies, and I've seen the images of women who were clearly violated over and over again until their bones broke. I don't need to prove that this happened to me. It did. But we need to keep reminding people that it happened, and that what happens, what's happening now did not start in a vacuum. And you know, the UN Secretary General stood up and said that to us, right? It didn't happen in a vacuum. No, it didn't. But nothing justifies what they did to us on October 7th, nothing. There's no context needed to condemn the murder of babies. I wanna just tell one story uh, because the denial is so strong and this is a photo I haven't been able to get out of my head for the last five weeks. This is the youngest of the people being held captive. His name is Kfir. He's now 10 months old. He was nine months old when he was kidnapped. He's now spent a tenth of his life in captivity. He was kidnapped along with his mother, his brother, and his father, taken from their community of Nil Oz into Gaza. Nil Oz is one of the closest communities to Gaza. There were 400 residents of Nilos before October 7th. 180 of them were either murdered or taken hostage. Nearly half of this community is gone. And this is just one of many. We need to tell their stories. We need to not let people forget. We need to bring Kfir and his family home. So we need to release those hostages. The aftermath has been an Israeli response in Gaza, which was something Hamas knew was going to happen. They prepared for it. They've said on the news many times, you know, for revolution, people have to be sacrificed, including our own civilians. They've said it out loud, that they use their civilians as human shields. Israel went into Gaza, slowly. We ordered an evacuation of northern Gaza. By the way, we ordered that evacuation now three weeks ago. And we waited many, many days before we actually went in 
to Gaza. And what we did is we've slowly now surrounded Gaza City. We cut it off from the south, and we've cut it off from the north, and now it is surrounded. And we are slowly moving in to the center of Gaza City. While we have also opened up a humanitarian corridor. So we took control over the area that cut Gaza in two, which means now we can protect the people who are trying to flee northern Gaza to southern Gaza. And in the last week, we have set up these humanitarian corridors with Israeli tanks watching as innocent Palestinians can walk to southern Gaza. And we've been monitoring this. By the way, we've also worried that they were smuggling potentially hostages in these crowds. And so we had megaphones saying to people, if anyone is Israeli or speaks Hebrew, run towards the soldiers. Nobody did. The hostages are still mostly entirely being kept underground. And we have propaganda videos that are coming out that try to say that they're being taken care of, right? And that they're, Hamas is great. And we all know that they're lies, which is why no Israelis share these videos. And please don't share them. It's just psychological warfare. I can't, I can't not mention the fact that in our fighting, 10,000 Palestinians have been killed. Now, I, I say that number hesitantly. And the reason is because I don't know if that number is fully true, because it comes from the Gaza Health Ministry, which is Hamas. And they have an incentive to inflate the numbers. That being said, they might be accurate. But here's what Hamas will never do. They will never tell you of those 10,000 who are innocent civilians and who are Hamas fighters. And that's a problem. Because in past wars, again, about half of the casualties have been terrorists. Let's add that they will say 4,000 children have been killed. I want to also note that anybody under the age of 18 is considered a child, which means you could be a 17-year-old fighter for Hamas and you would still be under the classification of child. Now that I've explained the numbers, I will say it again, just because I'm accused of this all the time, so I'm gonna say it again. I don't want innocent people to die in Gaza. And I know that Israel is doing its utmost to minimize casualties, but also achieve the goal. And that's different from in the past. In the past, it was minimized casualties, even if that meant messing up our operations. Not this time. We have a goal. We can't let Hamas survive. So what we're doing now, just so we know, minute by minute, we have now surrounded Gaza City, and we're closing in specifically to the hospitals. And people are saying, whoa, whoa, why, why is Israel fighting around the hospitals? These should be off limits. They should be off limits, which is why Hamas should not have built their command center underneath Shifa Hospital in Gaza. But they did. And so we're closing in on the hospital, and we're doing our best to try to get the casualties out of the hospital while also fighting Hamas terrorists. Because eventually, we're going to have to go underground and eliminate that command center underground. We've cut off. Get the civilian, what did I say? The terror, the, oh, the casualties, the civilians out, excuse me. To do this, Israel had to cut off fuel to the northern part of Gaza. And as a result of cutting off fuel, because fuel fuels Hamas, the hospital has now officially lost electricity. Israel today is helping to get all of the children, specifically the babies who were in incubators, to transfer them to other hospitals. They're doing all of this with the threat of Hamas, because Hamas is underneath, and we don't know where the terror tunnels come out into the hospital. Uh, the world will say this is not true. Even the head of the director of the hospital says, it's not true. I haven't seen any Hamas terrorists. I, say, I haven't seen any tunnels. Because you know, when you live under Hamas, you can speak freely. And you can tell the media and the news that there is a terror base underneath your hospital. It's remarkable, by the way. I mean, we look at the media. I'm just going to jump ahead because I'm running out of time. But we look at the media, and we see a reality where, sorry, I just really want to get to this image, where very quickly something happens, and Hamas's word is taken as gospel. But Israel, the IDF, we're biased. And so they have to double check everything we say. So when Hamas says Israel struck a hospital and 500 people were killed, the New York Times reports it right away. Right? And then slowly but surely corrects it, even though none of these corrections actually go out as push notifications. So everyone thinks that Israel still bombed a hospital and killed 500 people. 
And so the media is playing a role in this. They're in fact playing right into the hands of Hamas. Every day that they, start, that they continue to talk about casualties and blame Israel, and they take Hamas's word for it, and the director of a hospital being controlled by Hamas saying, no, no, there's no Hamas nicks here, and let me report that as gospel, Whereas what the Israelis say, well, there's no, there's no way to confirm that there's this base underneath the hospital. Bro, wait until we get there, and then we'll confirm it. But why is it that with me, everything is questioned, but with Hamas, everything is taken as the truth? I'll, I'll wrap up with this, because I know we're slowly coming to the end of our time. You know, I, I, I still can't grasp why you know, the international response, I'll, I'll go back to it for a second. The international response, to a certain extent, was supportive in the beginning. And it slowly dwindled as time has gone on. And I don't understand. I, I struggle. The first resolution passed by the UN Human Rights Council, the first resolution was not a resolution condemning Hamas for the clear-cut war crimes that they committed on October 7th. They couldn't muster up passing a resolution condemning the war crimes that were filmed and put online. The first resolution that they passed was a resolution calling for Israel to cease fire. And I wonder if I lived in a world where every leader of every freedom-loving country stood up and said, Hamas needs to surrender and release the hostages, what world I would be living in right now. Instead, I'm living in a world where, yet again, the world is looking at us as Jews and saying, please don't defend yourselves. Please stop. We don't like it. 300,000 people out in the streets in London yesterday. 300,000 people. And what did I hear is they're saying, pro-Palestine ceasefire. What am I hearing? I'm hearing Jews were really angry at the fact that you have the right to defend yourself these days. Guess what? We're going to keep defending ourselves. Whether the world likes it or not, I don't care anymore. I cared for a long time what the world thought. I've spent my life dedicated to try to get the world to understand us. And right now, I don't care. Understand me, don't understand me, I don't care. I'm going to do what I have to do. So we need your help. We need your help fighting the disinformation. We need your help to say to somebody, Every time you report about innocent civilian casualties and you leave out that Hamas uses them as human shields, you are a puppet of Hamas. You are getting more innocent people killed. If everyone shouted about human shields, Hamas maybe would question using the tactic in the future. But nobody ever calls them out. They just call out Israel. Their tactic works. So everyone and their mother on social media are puppets of Hamas. They're part of the propaganda war. And they're playing right into the hands of a terrorist organization. So we need your help. We in Israel, we're standing firm. There's no debate. We are grieving. Every day, mourning our dead. And it doesn't stop. Because people's bodies keep being identified and people keep dying. A young girl, American, who made Aliyah to Israel and was a police officer who was stabbed to death the other day in Jerusalem. Stories that oftentimes won't be told on the BBC or anywhere else because one Israeli just doesn't matter. We, um, we march, we stand up for ourselves. Jews around the world are fighting against anti-Semitism while Israelis are lining up to donate blood and to get what we need to our soldiers. And so we'll do our part in Israel. And if anyone's a good uh, hand in the farm, you might want to go to Israel and start picking some fruits and vegetables, because that's really what we need right now. But if not, every one of us has a role to play in combating the disinformation and helping people understand exactly why Israel is doing what it's doing today. I know I'm just at my time. I'm sorry, Conrad. I have a problem with going over time. It's been an issue with me. But I want to end with I think the reason why I'm so resolved. You know, I'm a historian. And I can talk to you about modern history, which I've spent most of my talk talking about. But the more I saw the story unfold of what happened on October 7th, it took me back to another history. 
It took me back to 1939. Really, it took me back to 1938. We just commemorated the anniversary of Kristallnacht. And then it took me back to 1939 with Hitler stating his intention to want to exterminate me, just like Hamas has. And then it took me back to the killing squads of the Nazis, the Einsatzgruppen, that most people don't really know about. They know about the gas chambers. They know about the death camps. They don't know about the Einsatzgruppen who rounded people up, had one mission, kill every Jew, man, woman, child, baby, elderly, it didn't matter, just like Hamas. And they marched into Poland, and they rounded up Jews in their villages, and they took them out to a synagogue and lit it on fire and burned them all alive, just like Hamas did in Be'eri and in Kfaraza. They rounded Jews up and took them out to a field and forced them to dig their own graves. And some Jews survived because they played dead underneath other Jewish bodies. Exactly how some people survived the Hamas atrocities, a young boy who listened as Hamas murdered both of his parents and then laughed about it and then spent the next eight hours hiding underneath their dead bodies. Hamas came back, but he had smeared himself with his parents' blood so they didn't shoot him again, and he survived. The Einsatzgruppen took photographs of what they did. They documented it. They celebrated it. They sent them home to their families, just like a Hamas terrorist who called his father from the phone of the Jewish woman who he had just murdered and said, Abba, look at your WhatsApp. I just sent you the photos of the people that I murdered. Abba, I murdered 10 Jews. Aren't you proud? And his father said, Allah Akbar, may God protect you, my son. So I'm resolved. Because the first gas chamber won't be built until 1942. And before that, a million and a half Jews had already been killed. And I lived in a world then where we had to beg the world to do something about this, and nobody did. And we allowed the Germans to develop their next plan, which was to exterminate the Jews by gas. And they developed that plan and proposed it in January of 1942. And now we know of it as the final solution. They laid it out for the Nazi elite in the famous conference we now know of as Vansi in January of 1942. So this is very simple for me. I now live in a world where I have a country that can do something about it. And we are going to, because I'm not letting Hamas get to the Vansi conference. I don't know how else to explain it to people. But I am facing evil in this world. And it has to be eradicated. And the tragedy we all know is that for evil to be eradicated, good people have to die. Just like in World War II, many, many good people had to die. And it's the tragedy of evil in this world, especially when evil embeds themselves amongst good. So Israel will do what it has to do. And I will remain resolved. Because I can't let them get to the Vansi Conference. I finally have something that I can do about it. And so can all of us. So I'm very grateful for all of you for standing with us and for making sure that they don't get to their next, their next scheme to massacre more Jews in this world. We won't let them. And we will do our utmost to rebuild Gaza so that people can live peacefully and in dignity and in independence. I dream of that day, and I wait for that day. We're not there yet. We'll get there. Thanks, everyone. Should I take questions? Uh, no, no we don't have time? We okay, have time. sorry. So thank you very much, Charlotte, for your very touching and, and personal story. And uh, thank you. being a strong voice that you are for the good. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate, I really appreciate, again, just everything, all that you're doing for us. Um, you know, so many Jews feel very alone right now. And it's amazing to stand in a room with mostly non-Jews um, who stand by us. Um, we, we need it now more than ever. 
So thank you so much. And I'm just going to flip through some of these slides on how you can help. And you can take photos of them before we go to lunch, OK? Just because I didn't get there. And I'm sorry I went over time. Can you hold that for one more second? So I'm just going to do that really quickly. Educate others. You can sit down now. Thank you for standing. I greatly appreciate it. Um, spread positivity on social media, uh, positive messages. Also keep talking about the massacre of October 7th. All right, snap those photos. One more. Report hateful comments. If you're online, reporting things gets things taken down. So let's get things taken down by reporting things online, reporting videos that are false or that are hateful. We can get things removed. Many things have already been removed in the last month because of people reporting it. Attend pro-Israel rallies. I know y'all are already doing that. Keep doing that. Attend the rallies. Show up. Wear that flag with pride. And um, follow Stand With Us' Situation Room. You can scan the QR code. This room online has everything that you need about what's happened before, after, every fact that you need. It will guide you to answers. If you're arguing with friends or peers, it will guide you to answers that will help you answer the tough questions that we are all now facing about Israel. I hope that my talk answered a lot of those questions. I am here for the rest of the day. If anyone has questions, please feel free. I'll be outside. You can come and ask me any questions you have. Thank you again all so, so much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>